I have no idea if someone's going to introduce me or just introduce yourself, I think. Or if I yeah, I no, yeah, no one no one said anything to me, they just abandoned me. <laughs> I'm cold and frightened. <laughs> Mike, I just called. <laughs> Thank you. And can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Good. So I'm a philosopher, and that means lover of Sophia. Philosophia. Philae Sophia. That's important. And that coming to Crete is very important for me because I was trained and raised in European philosophy before I went to India. Family from India. I went born in Trinidad in the West Indies, lived in Jamaica, it turns out in Kingston outside. I was living next door to Bob Marley's family, <laughs> and then came to New York and grew up in New York City, and the family s settled in America, and I've been living in the USA uh, since the early 50s. Some of you weren't born then, and uh, I educated in New York City, got my doctorate at Brandeis University in logic and uh, analytic philosophy and ontology, all in the Western tradition. And Socrates moved me deeply as a young boy, when I began to, to study philosophy, uh, because he called us to know thyself, above all else. The unexamined life is not worth living. That really spoke to me deeply. And as you know, Socrates, uh, in the Phaedo, uh, the, the great dialogue of Plato is in, in the death scene, where he's being sentenced to death unfairly by the sophists whom he exposed. Quite analogous to what we're hearing from some of our colleagues now in trying to challenge the establishment uh, ways of thinking, and becoming threatened in their life, politically, the same source. And um, so I guess we were starting. I, I, I was just improvising and saying a few introductory things as others came in, but they still are coming in. So that's been my training background as, as a lot. As a, I went to logic because it, it's supposed to be the, the, the laws of thought and consciousness. The DNA of consciousness is logic. It's not just about reasoning, it's about, do, do you understand the grammar of thought, of consciousness? And I felt that was important to get. And Aristotle, just following the theme of Greek uh, philosophy and how it spoke to me so deeply, uh, that was my origin, uh, you know, in terms of Plato and, uh, and Socrates and Aristotle. As you know, Aristotle is a student of Plato. And Plato, uh, inspired by his teacher Socrates, was seeking to, 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 to get the deepest source of, of, of when the lights go on in consciousness, which is, is the Logos. In the Greek, the Logos, that's going to be part of my presentation. The Logos is, in the Greek tradition, it's a, a, comparable to Om or Tao or Yahweh uh, in the other, the Judaic tradition. It's, it's the ultimate source of all words, of all speech, of all reason. So we become full humans and rational beings of Socrates and Plato, where we leave the cave of uncritical, unawakened thinking, and it's a transpersonal journey to leave the cave and go into the world of the forms, turn on the lights and reason, and awaken as a full human being. So Socrates was transpersonal in philosophy. And uh, so coming to Crete is extremely important because for Plato, Crete, uh, Crete was so important in the birthplace of the European imagination and the blueprint for Europe. <coughs> Uh, Whitehead, the great philosopher, said that the evolution of European thought consists in a running series of footnotes to Plato. <laughs> what? Because he was getting the code. He was attempting to get the code, the logos. And I speak of logos Sophia, because I'm a lover of Sophia in my profession. You know? And uh, so Sophia, Sophia is the feminine, infinite wisdom embodied, and very analogous to how Anne was speaking this morning about the source. And the, the, the universe itself, and all of the universe, is in that feminine energy, that Sophia. So I speak of Logo Sophia, one word. The light of reason, the light of the mind, of consciousness, when we become an awakened human, because we are Logo sapiens. Most people don't know that. We're of the Logos. That's our source. But somehow we seem to, in our evolution, whatever the reason, we seem to have been cut off from that source and a journey. And so we're in a cave consciousness, a cave literacy, a cave language that's cut off from the source. 
and, and, and that's what Socrates is warning, that come out of the cave into the light. And the, the, the measure for, for, law, for a human is to become a rational being, a wicked rational being, and awaken the soul. And remember who you are, while embodied, to, in a disciplined life of reason, open up the, the light of the mind, to, to open the world while you're in the body. That's rational awakening, that's transpersonal. I'm saying that because my being here with you uh, in the society of transpersonal psychology, brilliant, beautiful you know, movement, but I want to suggest, coming from transpersonal philosophy, and what's called deep ontology, transpersonal ontology, that's first primal science. Ontos is being in the Greek. And ontos logos is the science of being. So that's my early work in philosophy, is logic, the laws of thought. And Aristotle was a genius who first codified the science of logic and the laws of thought. Amazing developments. Right? And Plato saw in the Republic that when the mind, to bring justice in society, the rulers have to really awaken and touch the, 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 the ultimate source of the light of the mind. As the sun illuminates the planet and the world, the logos illuminates consciousness and reality. And that is the space of Logos Sophia, and that is our destiny. So we're Logos sapiens, not ego sapiens. And this is going to be important in my presentation. Because what I'd like to do in terms of transpersonal psych psychology and the beautiful theme, we have metamorphosis. We spoke about it in the morning panel, some of you were there, that metamorphosis means transformation, and we can use it in all kinds of ways. But we can go through transformations within the ego sphere, within the ego language, space, and culture. And as great as those transformations are, it's not transformation to the source. To go through the deep shift of awakening, which is the path of enlightenment, whatever name you'd like to use. And that was Buddha's awakening, Buddha's great awakening, when he saw that humans were suffering. He was diagnosing medically that humans would get caught and stuck along the way in our evolutionary journey to becoming a full human, where we could be, enter the source. So the consensus across the planet, I want to speak from global transpersonal. And even the word transpersonal, I don't prefer because the great teachers, I'm going to use this. This is my PowerPoint I'll be creating live. And while I'm speaking, even though I've been a professor of philosophy for the last 46, I'm in my 47th year at Hanover College, founded by the Quakers, who were transpersonal Christians. So my college is founded on transpersonal principles and we've forgotten it. It's completely ego mental. And it's been a war zone for me to just hold this space. And we'll get into that now. But some of our colleagues are speaking about the, the dangers of speaking from transpersonal shifts in the academic world and in the culture at large and getting a lot of you know, backlash and punishment and exposure for that. And that's real. I feel that. I've been living that for over 40 years and standing for what the great philosophers stand for, which is we've got to get into the zone, we've got to get into the source, we've got to tap our origin and, and open up the codes and DNA. So in a way, the title of my talk is The Quest for the Missing Code of Logosophia. The code of all codes. And I use the Greek Logosophia, uh, and the code is not a code that we can present as information. It's trans-informational. We have to be informed ourselves. It's not information. But to be well informed, you have to enter into form. And that's a, the code of love, which is to become the sor sourceful. And when we can rise into the source, which is a rite of passage from being an ego sapien into becoming a whole human being. And so to me, the transpersonal is, in a way, a, a word I think that may be giving our power away. Because if you listen to the great teachers, Lao Tzu, <coughs> the Tao that is named is not the Tao. Again, this is not a lecture I'm giving, but a meditation. So please receive it as a meditation. That's why I invited you not to take notes, right? Because, because I, I, I want to just, it's a journey we're doing now. And as I speak, I'm seeking to invoke the field and not to give you information. And you'll see why, okay? So this is a meditation and I jokingly call this, you know, where Shakti Pad is. This is not an ordinary pad, it's a Shakti Pad. <laughs> so what I'm doing is calligraphy. I'm going to put up a visualization to capture over 3,000 years of evolution of wisdom and a kind of picture that you say, wow. Because when you see the picture I'm about to present, the calligraphy of wisdom and the journey from the ego sphere to the logosphere, 
uh, you'll see, wow, if all the geniuses are calling us to become human and actually be a person, a mensch, why are we called giving personality here? The ego sapien culture has dominated the planet. Because the person, not that we have to go transpersonal as if that, they're all saying, here's the person. The ego sapien is pre person. So we're not going to transpersonal, we're trying to become, we want to become persons. We want to go to, so not trans, so the journey of being a human is to become a personal match. And that is to awaken and touch the source of who we are, open up our DNA of the lowest code that's implanted within us. So I guess I'll introduce myself. I was just ad libbing uh, before we started, but we started. And so welcome. I'm Ashok Gangadine. I'm a professor of philosophy, a philosopher, Haverford College, which is outside of Philadelphia and founded by the Quakers. You may know about the Quakers, it's very close to the transpersonal because they saw that the crisis, not in the church, not in the Pope, not in the minister, not in the text, but here. And therefore, let's gather and face each other and allow the Christ to speak. Right? And that, that, there's, there's that of God in every person, and that of every person in God. And that's the founding of my college. And I've been there 47 years now, I'm 47 there teaching, and what I've been teaching is awakening global consciousness and global enlightenment. And I've been named a professor of global philosophy for this, pioneering the global space, and the global code. So whether, when I gesture here in the meditation, I'm, I'm gesturing to the deep space, the source. And when I gesture here, it's to where humanity seems to be uh, now across the planet. It's equal opportunity. It's not a Western materialism thing. It is a stage of technology of consciousness that in our, in our human development, that we have been developing language to talk about and describe the world. Language is meaning, is information, of description of the world. And we don't realize, according to our great geniuses, that as great as that is, and we have to honor it, to have gotten that level of language development, they call us to a deeper, more higher voltage language, a missing script. The Buddha was calling us here, yoga is calling us here, Socrates is beckoning in Plato to the Logos. Christ is dying and sacrificing to take us into the Logos of the flesh. Right? Lao Tzu is saying the Tao that his name is not the Tao. And they're all seeing that there's something we have to become. Let me take a pen. I'll start with black and go to blue. So what I'll do here is to try and imagine here with me in this whole the calligraphy, the great names all of the call of our great scriptures and great revered teachers calling us and naming this fundamental infinite force. It's infinite. The Tao, which is in the Chinese, for, for the fundamental ultimate code of all codes, that everything comes from, that is named in our everyday culture, is not the Tao. The opening lines of Lao Tzu. Om, the source of all the universe, the deepest source of all possibilities in language and words and forms, and names from Om. Don't predicate on Om, meditate on Om. Meditation is a different technology of consciousness that's in the art of becoming an awakened human being. So when you go into yoga, the yoga, Krishna, the, speaking the, the voice of Om to Arjuna, who is the broken uh, warrior that collapses on the battlefield, if you read the Bhagavad Gita. I'm just looking, I'm gesturing across the planet. So when you go into the deepest Vedic, Veda knowledge, right? the yogis were able to meditate to touch all. And they said, that's where we become a human, the Atman. So when Gandhi was living this, and he became Mahatma. Maha is great, Atma, that wasn't his name, it was his title. He became Mahatma, great Atman, great self, transpersonal. And he brought it into the, into the political arena to challenge a regime and to help liberate India. And Martin Luther King took some of that technology to the civil rights, right? And, and, and he was really bringing the own power, the satya, truth force, into the political structures that we're, we're facing all around us now. So the, all of the yoga philosophy and technology, when Arjuna, the warrior, so let me start filling in this calligraphy. So we're going to see that the space in which we are raised is the screen. Let this be the screen of our consciousness. The, what, what shows up to us. And the self, the viewer, the, the thinker, is she is outside, 
so there's a line here between the knower and the known, the thinker and what is thought, the perceiver and what is perceived, the feeler and what is felt. So all of our information and language and culture is taking place in this mental space. And Aristotle called it the space of thought, the space of predication. We take subjects and predicates and we join them to make information. And all of our life is being lived in the space of predication. The predicate is the art of language. The subject, Socrates is wise. So rain is not falling. I am hungry. I am thirsty. Whatever, my internal mental states. So this is where the consciousness is happening. This is where the language is. And the language is picturing the world out there. And if I say snow is white, it's true if snow is white, a fact. And if my language pictures the fact, then I have truth. So truth is a relationship between the thinker having a thought with a, a language, whatever the language may be. Il pleut, es regnet, it is raining. Three different languages, but they're all saying rain's falling. Right? Why? We don't even know why we translate different languages. But the, the point in building up is that this stage of development of humans, to however we were before, to come to this was a great stage, a breakthrough, to be able to convey information and have meaning and have the technology of language here. But what we'll see is that the, the, the great teachers, who are the transpersonal teachers across the planet, or the transpersonal philosophers and ontologists were calling us, they realized that the deep field of reality cannot be contained here. We've got to keep the journey going. So when Arjuna in the Gita breaks down in a fratricidal war, his own family is at war, and, and the Bhagavad Gita is the story between Krishna, for example, and the Om story. So you have the Tao, the Om, the Allah, the Yahweh, the Shunyata Buddha, and the Logos, of the Greek philosophy, this is amazing. Allah is the name for the infinite, and to be, to be Islam is to surrender to the infinite. Why? Because it's first, and if we are here, we're putting this first. And if we privilege our story and our ID, because we make ourselves right here, think about it. When we think, when we use this technology, then we become a subject to predications. And who am I? I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, I'm a male, I'm a father, and I have all Brahman. of... Pardon me? Brahman. Yes, thank you. But Om is Brahman. I can keep going. I know. Yeah. So we put Brahman up to make him happy. <laughs> I didn't put Christ. I didn't put God. I can keep going. You follow. The consciousness, when it begins to follow the, the source, recognizes there's an infinite first. And all across the planet, if you look back and step out of one particular... I can be a Christian in the Christ language. And I can be saying, I embrace the, the Christ. Jesus is my Lord. God, I believe in God. I, these are all my mental states. My belief system. My intentions, my thoughts. My understanding, my reason. It's all here. This is the technology that we're using for literacy. But the teachers are saying... Don't be stuck here because if you see, if you make yourself an object, that's where the, the, the ego mental person is. So transpersonal is saying, no, we've got to go beyond the transperson here. But what these teachers say, this is where you are a person. When you awaken the Christ, you become a full human. When you break out of the box, Buddha saw all of Buddha's insights in Buddha's great awakening, when he calls this field shunyata or emptiness. And by the way, this is here for the infinite field. And when you try that, this line is extremely important because when you're playing this technology, you're cutting yourself off from direct access to the source. So when Anne spoke and she said, well, the male in the Western culture, the, 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 the patriarchal culture is to blame because it really separated from the feminine and from humans and nature and began that, I would rather say that this line that represents the great line of separation, which in the biblical term is called sin, and in the East is called samsara. The condition of Arjuna when he collapses on the battlefield and his world collapses, he doesn't realize it's because he's using this technology. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful technology of culture so far. And you have your ID, 
What is your ID? Who you are? It's your bundle of predicates. And you make yourself a being, and this is the being in the box. And when you become an entity in a box, you make yourself cut off from, because you separate yourself from the deep interconnectivity when you could go deeper into the source. So, as we think about transpersonal, and the topic, disintegration, integration, and mindful living. I'd like to address that from this point of view. And I want to place the challenge to us in this culture of transpersonal. Because if we're not even bringing this up and seeing all of this as transpersonal transformation, of literacy, of consciousness, of language, this is a different language, this is a different script. I'll try to demonstrate how. That's a code of love of Sophia, which is a code of Om, the code of Brahman, the code of Tao. All the great texts are trying to get us to upgrade, but we keep downloading. Because this is the language we know. That's serious. This is tragic. Because we've had this for what, thousands of years, this teaching. And, if, uh, and I imagine I'm writing a movie script, part of my book called Awakening Global Enlightenment. Global Enlightenment. Global means for all of these worlds. They're all touching the deep enlightenment. Buddha's enlightenment. Jesus is Socrates. Krishna. Lao Tzu. These enlightened teachers. Right? They're not going all over the place and tapping the source because you're seeing it's infinite, whatever name you use. Well, if it is infinite, how many names does it have? Infinite names. So Allah and Yahweh are not fighting, they hang out. And Brahman, across borders. Because all of the borders we create here and all of the languages and broken religions and narratives and ideologies that are at war, Right? That's not what's going on in the source. Because it's not just the infinite line, because it's infinite, it's infinitely one. You can't multiply and have two, three, four infinites. That would be nonsense. Everyone knows that. Because then it would not be infinite. Because the infinite is not bound. If you have an other, it's bound. So it's infinitely one. So here, O Israel, the Lord is one. Brahman is one. Shunyata is one. Which one? The same one. <laughs> not this language. The one. Only the one. The, the two languages, please. And we have been using this language, and the teachers have been saying, don't be stuck here. Become more intelligent. Upscript to the transpersonal intelligence of non-dual, integral, holistic, sign power. And that's really the focus of my, my talk. So that the question of metamorphosis it's an, an, it is to go from an ego-sapien, a monocentric, living in an I-it culture, because this line cuts us off from source. It then starts splitting between the thinker and the subject who thinks and the object of thought. We objectify our experience. It becomes a content. It pictures the world. And we have many different lenses to represent the story. And so we have multiple worlds, boundless worlds competing for that space. So the biblical world is saying, God is the creator, let there be light. Ah, I got it. And even one person can be multiple personalities and, 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 and ontological schizophrenia because I can be a be believing Jew or Christian or Muslim, believing in God and the biblical story. That's my worldview. But I'm also a scientist and I know that uh, astrophysics is teaching me the universe is expanding. And the Big Bang is true. So now I'm already in a headache because I'm hearing, let there be light is the origin, Genesis. Yeah, big Bang. That's a big ouch in my consciousness. That's a cut in my being. And if I don't know how to dialogue across my different worlds, and what is dialogue? It's deep communication. What is that? Dialogos. Dialogue doesn't mean two people talking. That's monologue. If I'm speaking from my lens, I believe in the biblical truth, and you're the scientist believing in your truth, and you have different narratives, and they don't make sense to each other. Because when you cross worlds, I'm going very fast. I'm covering 3,000 years. <laughs> in half an hour. But I'm just giving you this cal calligraphy, and it looks messy, but it is messy. I'll turn the page soon and make it very simple. Let's start off fresh. So I'm speeding. Fast forward. But you're all, this audience is advanced, so you're with me. You're with, this is just rehearsing what you know. But worlds are worlds apart. And the world is a lens that you use to see the world. Kant saw that, the great philosopher Kant. 
that what appears to us is not coming anew, it's processed through our lens, through our conceptual structure. So that we are, this is our life, this is our being, this is who I am, this is my experience, this is my culture, it's our world. But my world is a function of my mental processing. So we are as we mind, is one of the axioms of the great teachers. How we use our mind, that's what we get. If we ego mind, we have an ego life. If we're using an ego calculus, we're going to have multiple broken worlds in the Tower of Babel. You're going to have 9 11 genocide, Holocaust, ethnic cleansing, violence, which are broken marriages, broken relationships. Why? Because the technology of naive predication, pre awakened, is using a powerful principle that holds the planet captive. A is A. A thing is what it is. A or B. If it's A, it's not B. So it starts to cut and polarize. Because the law of identity makes everything have its own space. And so if I'm going to play that game of identity, I am me, I'm a shark. I got my own space. And in philosophy it's called being an atom. An atom is an ultimate self-sourcing unit. Self-source, no? Whereas the teachers are saying, there is no self-source separate unit atom. It's all interflow. It's anatomic. That was the essence of Buddha. Buddha's awakening was, if you make yourself an atom, you're dead in the water. That's the source of suffering. And you have to see that when you atomize yourself, you're using a mental processing that is chop chopping everything into separate identities. Space is space, time is time, motion is motion, color is color, figure, and everything has its own ID. How do you put it together? Who cares? Who knows? It's just together. In other words, the law of identity doesn't have the resource for relational flow. Relational flow, which is what Buddha, Christ, Jesus, all are saying, is that the source is relation. That's what Anne was also saying this morning. The divine feminine is where relation. But when you fall into this culture, whether you call it patriarchal, or whether it may be equal opportunity for males and females, who are ego sapiens, is another matter. We don't have to get into that. Right? But the point is that across the planet, humans, east and west, north and south, are using a predicated ontology and mind operating system and shaping our worlds and getting our narratives, and science is using this, its own lens. If I have a Newton lens, or a Ptolemy lens, or a Copernicus lens, or an Einstein lens, you shift your lens, you shift your facts. Right? So which lens, when postmodern culture is saying, just check out your own lens. All you've got is your own lens. There is no deeper lens or truth. And Socrates died for that. Because the sophists were saying it's all relative. Truth is relative to your perspective. So sophistry is the art of teaching how to convince the jury of your position. Your narrative, you have to be a rhetorical spin dog. Right? And Socrates is asked to die for because he understood the world of Logos, was getting eclipsed by that culture. And when he challenged the sophists, he said, we're going to take him out. He's postmodern. I mean, <laughs> he's transpersonal, that's what I'm going to say. Right? He was trying to do the transpersonal. He said, no, it's too dangerous. Because if you're right, that our entire cultural structure of literacy is up for reconstruction, disintegration, right? Reintegration, metamorphosis. This is huge. So I would say that looking at our theme, disintegration is not that things are falling apart. They are. 9-11's genocide, Holocaust, the Middle East, intractable, broken situation of worlds that cannot find a common ground. The common ground is here. This is where peace is to be found where these worlds are self-sourcing narratives. When you go to the source, they could not step out beyond the source. So I'm going to do something that's outrageous. I began to see as a philosopher teaching this year after year to my students, the Gita, Jesus' breakthrough. You know, when Jesus saw that this, this is where we suffer and this is sin, and he gave his life for the Christ to cross into the Christ space. When, you were, when I was in prison, he visited me. When I was hungry, he fed me. He saw the interrelational connection of that space. And he was trying to teach the disciples, why do we do that? How do I? And he says, unless you die, you can't be born again. The rite of passage is not to deprecate yourself, or your, but to let it go. Let go of your artificial ID. The way you're objectifying yourself with a particular narrative and go up, upscript to a much more powerful voltage when you discover who you really are. That's the journey. And to me, that's what the transpersonal is seeking to do as a culture, is to say, okay, if this is what we're causing the person, we're causing the human or the person, 
and rationality? <laughs> okay, you can have it. Let's go transpersonal. And I'm saying, should we do that? If this is a person, why do we call that transpersonal when it's really this is it? Becoming the person. You follow? And the question, are you fighting against or fighting for at that point? If you give the power here and say, okay, you're the primary language, and we're going to eke out some space outside of that, you're first, and we're going to be, you know, transpersonal is going to be defined over against that, that may not be the most powerful. Jesus wouldn't do that, Buddha wouldn't do that, Krishna wouldn't do that. But why? Because this field surrounds and sources everything. That's the outrageous act I'm performing. I'm using, so let me make it clear, I'm using double parentheses to mark when you cross into the source language and single markers to mark when you speak this language. That's one of the innovations of my work. I saw that in studying these great teachers and living in their spaces, I saw the futility of the, Krishna is teaching Arjuna the path of yoga into the home space of awakened life. Arjuna wants to download Krishna's voice and teaching here into his familiar language. That's what we all do. Buddha teaches that you have to let go of this. His four noble truths are this is suffering, it has a cause, clinging to your ID. We have a choice, the third noble truth. We don't have to use this mind operating process, we're addicted to it. And the fourth noble truth, we can rehabilitate and trans transpersonal our mental habits to rehabilitate our consciousness to a higher Buddha script, which is the Dharma of connectivity and compassion. So the essence of Buddha's journey was the call to awaken the human and somehow let go of this place that holds us in samsara. So this line is equal opportunity across the planet. Those who use this technology for their lives and their cultures, and it's really a pandemic, right, are using something that cuts us off from a deeper sourcing. And that would be my diagnostic of why we are still in this condition, as an adolescent stage of our development. Because when we hear the word God, we say, oh, I, I love God, God is love. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And here's the Buddha, I'll give you the Four Noble Truths. I jokingly tell my students, I'm teaching Buddhist philosophy again, now, this semester. And when they come into the class, it's a packed room, I say to them, if you're here and your students came to college to this one of the best in the nation because of your high literacy, you're hyper-literate, you're great, thank you, you got in, and you're great to get information. I'll give you Buddha's Four Noble Truths very fast. Existence is suffering. It has a cause. The cause is clinging to the ego identity. We have a choice, and we can rehabilitate our minds and our lives and our being by the eightfold path of mindful living, conscious awakened life, 24-7. So I put that on the board in the predication space. And say, so you got the course? That's why I said, don't take notes. You follow? They go, oh, I got the information. Rather than the transformation, Transinformation. Information is disinformational. When you put it in the zone, in the field, and I use that metaphor for my students who are athletes and musicians, who somehow know that their peak moments are when they just go transpersonal. They didn't plan it. They're running. This young lady is running around nature trail year after year. One day in the fall, she was nature. She was the running. She wasn't just I am running. It's running am I. I use double brackets. In fact, it's ironic that if you look at the uh, announcement of my topic, what I said and put in was finding the missing code of logos. Sophia. And I use double brackets, but they drop the double brackets and put single brackets on the title. Did you notice? <laughs> the missing logos code. Well, to me, that is... You know, so single bracket simply is... It became so important in our human journey that all our great teachers are calling us to this language. And we keep putting it here. And we don't even realize, because all of our different worldviews are competing and for this space, that we don't realize that it's, it's all equal opportunity technology. So that the separation line, when you do this, so Adam's fall and Eve was eating the fruit of knowledge and fell from this connectivity. So sin is worse than we thought. I hate to say that. It is not just that we bad. 
but our, our condition is severed from connectivity. And that line of sin is the analogous line in the East for samsara, which is falling into a cycle of repeated generation after generation of lifetimes. Why? The common reason is we are buying into predication as the ultimate script. We are sharing the same technology of consciousness. And when you see that, then this line becomes sinsara. Make up a new word. Because now when you open the global lens, you say, oh, what's called sin in the biblical world is not just unique to the biblical believers. It's a condition of the human who's cut off from, from, from grace. But when you listen to Buddha and Krishna in the yoga, samsara is what? The cycle of repeating lives cut off from, from moksha. It's bondage. It's in the cave, Socrates. So the cave, the samsara, the sin, is common to using this technology, and it holds us captive, and it splits everything it touches, and breaks our worlds apart, because every narrative has, has its own ID. So the biblical story, and uh, the story of physics, and the story of being an ecumenical American, and now I'm chanting Om and doing my yoga, and now I'm practicing some Feng Shui with a tree-hugging friend. And I'm, you know, but these are all separate, and I'm not. So the I here, and the I here, and the I here, and the I, when you say A is A, no, which A? When you say in the marketplace of culture, I, it resonates across these different worlds, they're different meanings. So we can be in ontological schizophrenia, multiple persons in this broken space, if you live the life of identity. And that's what the geniuses were saying. So when Arjuna broke down on the battlefield and his life fell apart in the opening of the Gita, which is a dialogue between Om, the Om voice, Krishna, and Arjuna. How, how can they dialogue? Krishna is speaking the Om script, and he's speaking from the yoga, intelligence, the transpersonal script, and Arjuna who's steeped in the culture that he hangs in. And he doesn't yet know that his war and his broken family is a result of the technology he's using. That's the point I'd like to stress most of all. We don't see across the planet that we are colonized at a stage of adolescent development, of buying into a naive, talk about it, give the information, live the law of identity, even though our teachers are saying, this is medically dysfunctional, because it cuts us off from a deeper language. When you go into the zone, so imagine now, I begin to see that this is a breakthrough, the global, the global enlightenment is that Om, Tao, Yahweh, Allah, Shunyata, all of these names for the infinite first are alter names. I invented a world. They're not just synonymous. They're holonyms. It's a new word. They're holonyms. Allah, Yahweh, Brahman, God are alternative sacred names for the infinite. So that unity in the double bracket space is not the same as unity in this language. And what we have in culture is that these two are conflated in the same place. The source language and the predicative language and the meditative language are in the same place. They're conflated. And it's fatal. And that's why we've not been able to deconflate and say, oh, Krishna is speaking a different, deeper grammar, a transpersonal. And we've been listening to him here. So the battle of the Bhagavad Gita, the dialogue, is Krishna is coaching. He's not giving information. He's not giving a theory. This is where you get theories and ideologies and informations and narratives. Krishna realizes in yoga technology, when Arjuna breaks down as a stand-in for all humans, that he's got to find a way to move deeper and deeper into the Om Sun. For the Atman, the transpersonal awakened self, to come forth. And he knows that Arjun is going to use everything in his power to downscript everything Krishna speaks in his language into his Arjuna's language. So when Krishna takes him through chapter two and says, knowledge and intelligence is far superior to mere action. Arjuna, pick up your weapon and fight. The beginning of chapter three, Arjuna is very angry with Krishna. He says, Krishna, you're confusing my mind. You're saying that knowledge is superior to action, but you're asking me to pick up my weapon and fight. Which is better? Tell me decisively, either or, which is true? And Krishna smiles, because he knows the logic of the logos, of the om, of the deep space, 
is an integral logic, holistic, not a dual. And that when you really awaken intelligence, that is the highest form of action and activity. And what might be dual here and split, like theory and action, the talk and the walk, are broken, the mind and the body, the universal and the particular, the local and the global, the I and thou, all broken apart, are healed in the integral space of the script. So let me say a little bit more about so say more about that. Why don't we have this script despite the fact that our great geniuses and scriptures were calling us to this script? Why do we keep that down, down rather than up scripting? And the infinite, this is, a, and I think that I found that Anne's comments this morning were very uh, apropos. Uh, as a, I feel like partnering with her in terms of her opening up the space because when she's saying the source is connected, everything is connected. Every grain of sand, if you could see it, has the infinite in it. The pen, if you could see the pen in the field, where it's infinite. Because it's infinite, it's infinitely one. And because it's infinite, there's infinite unity. And because it's infinite unity, not finite unity, but infinite unity, it has infinite diversity. It handles boundless diversity. That's Indra's net. The divine net is a network of infinite points, and each point is sacred. And yet, in fractal power, connected with every other point. Right? Every point is fractal. So in Blake, the poet is saying this infinity in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. If you could tap time here, so time here, like everything else, is always broken apart. The past, that's over. The present, well, that's moving. The future, not yet. We tag them, we name them with identity, and the future, I could get stuck in the future. Therapists know I'm so anxiety-ridden about getting into medical school or paying my mortgage or getting my, I'm stuck, I can't live now. Or I've been abused and violated in the past and wounded, and I'm carrying my wounded child, and I can't get over it. I'm living my past story. And even though the psychotherapy is trying to help us free ourselves of that narrative and heal the child so that I can become whole and function in society. You see what I mean? So this time is broken. The past, the present, and the present, if that's where you want us to be here now, if you read Eckhart Tolle, and this is all you've got, be here now. Of course, that's not what the teachers are saying. When they say be here now, they mean here and now, an integral, holistic, awakened time, Zen time, right? So then if you go into double bracket, and I would say to Eckhart Tolle, this is the power of now. When you tap a moment here in deep time, it's all interconnected. The entire universe of past and future are meeting in that moment. That's a fractal now. And that's the power of now. And here, in space, all the universe, you can be right here. This not here, here. There's, there's two languages. Well, I keep getting stuck here. There's two languages. And I'm just trying to help activate the transpersonal language of these teachers. When Jesus is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is not the predication. That is Christ's script. Here, when you cross this space of broken, separated identity language into the Christ integral healed thing, that's why he says you can't write the laws in stone. You've got to be it and live it in your heart. Why? Because the word is living here. So in the beginning is the word. What word? The logos, let's say. Well, in the beginning, before this, this is derivative word. In the beginning is the word. That word is so powerful and infinite, it's filled with all the information and all of reality has come out of that word. The word here, the Tao, the Om, that's named is not the Logos. So the word here, language here, is anemic. I use sentences in a particular human language to describe the world. It works in identity and every name has its identity and meaning and it pictures the world. That word is broken. That's not where God is. So to say in the beginning is a logos, oh, that's a whole different language. You mean the infinite word. And when the infinite word thinks, let there be light, the Big Bang happens. The infinite. This is an infinite thought. It doesn't have to be uttered like this thinking. I hope you're getting this. So informational, predicated, descriptive language is representational. But language in the zone is presentational, is performative. The thinker and the 
word and the meaning and the reality are meeting in a PowerPoint. And the genius of Descartes, for modern European thought, when he saw a brave person for transpersonal, he saw I could doubt every belief. I could doubt every story I have. Two plus two equals four. What if there's a demon deceiving me and making it look as if it's true to me as a, as, as a thinker when it's false? In other words, the split between the thinker and the thought and the reality allows a space for self-deception. And therefore, it's not grounded. And you can doubt every belief you have and every narrative is up for grabs and that's both modern. There's no grounding. Our narratives are my story and your, you got your story. And they're all viable. Let's live with it. All right? And the genius says, no, there is truth. It's a deeper place you go if you can get over the artificial. These are artificial derived stories. That's why Buddha said our narratives are constructed. They're artificially constructed by a lens of a, of a located, separated thinker using an artificial language. Whereas if I can cross into the awakened script that is non-dual, so that's what I'm trying to clarify. We use the word non-dual. What does that mean? It means that you cannot use the identity tag to break everything apart. It's integral. So every word. So if you go into the ohm space, you can't break a piece of ohm off. If you try to break a piece of the infinite off, what are you going to get? Ohm. It's ohm baked. You follow? It's going to be, that's why they say there's that of God in every man. Because we are Logos sapiens. And so in that field, the infinite is encoded in every person. And every person is encoded in the field. So when Descartes sees experiment on how he blew it, he didn't get Descartes. And it took Husserl, Edmund Husserl, to wake us up and say, wait a minute, we missed. Because Descartes, so he can question everything in his world. And he got scared. He says, I'm going to have to drop my story about my body. There goes my body. I'm going to drop my psyche. There goes my psyche. I'm going to drop my whole culture and all of the disciplines, everything that are going on here. And he was scared. And then he said, I am. Double bracket. What I am, I don't know. He had no more predications. He stripped it. It was a brave moment. He was scared. I am. I don't know what I am, but I am. That I am is certain. What I am, I have no clue. Let me find out. And what did we do? We put him right here. I am. We put him right back in the box. Oh, Descartes' first principle, I think, therefore I am. And then he went on to prove that God exists. It's nonsense. He was here. He entered the meditative script, the deep source script, and the, the courageous person was lost in a post, you know, a, a transpersonal vocabulary that was starting because his person, he was tapping his deep self that was always with him and it couldn't be predicated. It was pre-predicated. And he was scared. If you read the beginning of that second, third meditation, he says, Yesterday's meditation has filled me with such, I feel free floating, I don't know what is up or down anymore. I don't know who I am or what I am, I know that I am. And as he went through that, he began to realize in the third meditation, a brilliant discovery, that the infinite is present. The proof that an infinite being, God, is already present to him, was a great eye moment. It's a great proof, but you try to use reason and use a proof here, which is what philosophers do, and say, you can't prove that God exists. But you're using the wrong technology. Didn't listen to Descartes in his transpersonal moment. Right? He was almost discovering the whole yoga philosophy for Europe and the Buddha philosophy. He was discovering it on his own. And the culture wasn't backing him up with the whole vocabulary of Buddha's centuries of, of the tradition learning to speak the Dharma or the yoga technology of the Vedas. I mean, yeah, at least you have the meditative traditions. But so, so, so Descartes, I'm using an example. But when you go in to touch the field, something powerful happens to your script. Language goes into high voltage. So I'm going to turn and take away this mess again. Oh, doesn't that feel good? <laughs> Let's start over. Because that's huge. There's no stepping out of the infinite space. No ego sapien has the power to say, oh, here I am. I got my space. I'm on Facebook. <laughs> right? You can't. In fact, every possible narrative is sourced by the field. This is huge for activism. It means that nirvana, 
is here now. It means the high self of every person is right here now and with you. You're with it. Relax. When I, when I did this, my students started to breathe. Because before that, I had, I had here is the I, and here is where we're living in our culture. Brilliant, have it for brilliant our students. They got to see that, oh, professor, I see that the, the teachers are teaching us to get into the zone. And I've been in the zone, I've been running, and I've been jazzing, and whatever, when I feel that high voltage, I know it, I know it's real. But how do I go there, professor? How do I let go of who I am in my culture, and my whole script and intelligence that got me here to really go into that space? I don't know how. And then I pointed out when I did this, I said, this is how you should write your name from now on. Whatever your name is, you have to realize you're already. This symbol is very powerful, calligraphy. <coughs> Whatever story or worldview you have, it gives you your ID. Or even multiple stories here, symbolized in this. Your high self, your transpersonal self, is already there. You are inscribed in your high self. It's very close. Your high self is closer to you than you are. The ego is displacing you. And so the path of enlightenment and awakening is a therapy to loosen up that lens. Loosen up that whatever it is. Scientific lens, it's an Einstein lens, a Newton lens, is it a, a, even your psychology science lens, your, your transpersonal lens. If you're using this script for transpersonal, if this is where you're speaking, oh, there's a person and the culture speaks of the we have to go transpersonal to the transpersonal self, but you're here, then I, I want to pose a question to our culture. Are we listening to the teachings of our great transpersonal pioneers who make it clear that you have to somehow let go of this technology? And it's a technology, an adolescent stage of our development, great as it is to get information at all, is disinformational. Take the pen. We all know how to predicate the pen. It's plastic, this one is black with silver, it's made for writing, and I can tell you all this predicates. And I, it's disposable, and when I'm finished, I'll throw it away. Do I dare put the pen here? When I do that around the planet when I speak, and I prepare the way it says, wow, if you dare to cross this line of separation into <coughs> this space, where every point is a PowerPoint, and every grain of sand is a miracle, and every human being is sacred, and everything about us is every space and time, everything is beautiful and sacred in this zone, what would the pen be like here? Oh my God, OMG. You know, that pen, if you picked it up on Mars, it's going to be headline news tomorrow. <laughs> right? Oh, pen with Mars. Houston, you got a problem. Whoa, pen on Mars? Do you know what it means? Extraterrestrial intelligence and culture and writing. And the pen is mightier than the sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. Right? That all of those kinds of wisdom here. So why don't we do that with ourselves? Why are we mutilating ourselves in the box, right, and not saying, I am. So I'm trying to, to make it user-friendly. The, the, when I introduce the double bracket, single bracket, and I point out that the double brackets, the infinite space, surrounds every possibility, and all of our stories are grounded in the field. And the greatest force is not gravity, it's levity. It's a call of the infinite source. It's an infinite source cannot be overlooked. You may not even detect it in the ego or life. You may not respect but it's operative every moment. So an athletes go into the zone spontaneously without planning it and stepping outside of the self or we're going to dream experience and we drop our lens for a moment in deep dreams and new experiences begin to show. We're going in from this enclosed artificial space into the more expansive literacy of the zone, zone script. And that's where I'm suggesting the transpersonal culture is, is, is pushing it. Uh, uh, is requiring us. And, and so if we try to, to come out in terms of transpersonal narratives and insights and research here in this space, what are we doing? Because this is the greatest power possible. That's what Gandhi was rec recognizing and Martin Luther King and Jesus and other pioneers that the Christ is greater than what's in the box. And Jesus was saying, as a logos in the flesh. So when you write logos, use the double brackets, because that means source, not logos here. If you write feminine, let's write it here, Sophia. 
the infinite Sophia, the goddess. But there's also the awakened divine masculine here. It's not that the masculine is here and that they never be patriarchal and cannot rise. Men and women stand up. Come into who you are. That was Jung. The anima and the animus have to be integrated in every person. In that PowerPoint of becoming an individual, which means not divided. Individual is divided. Individual means undivided. But here, the ego sapien is always divided. It's cut from its source. There's a split within the soul between the ego and the self. The ego and the person. This technology objectifies everything it touches in the box and predicates it as an object of thought. And we don't realize that's objectification. It's not that we're living in a materialistic culture. We can also objectify our spirituality. Our spirituality can be talked about and put and desecrated. This is sacred space. This is desecrated because it's cut off. And the sacrifice of all the great teachers say you've got to sacrifice, burn it off, let it go in order to cross into who you are. To let that fixated, rigid story open up to allow yourself to breathe and step into who you are. Which is a journey of awakening and enlightenment and the transpersonal journey the way I see it. Right? That's, that's really the pathway. So metamorphosis, just to sum up, because I really I want to hear your voices. Yeah, this was just to provoke you into dialogue, in a friendly way. The disintegration is not just our worlds are falling apart, look what's going on, global warming. That's true. But our worlds were never together. Our world was already fragmented. There's this technology of culture making, which we didn't realize is objectifying. And a moral teacher said, never treat a person as an object. A moral being, a person, it's not an object. So when women say, don't treat me as an object, it's just a, a symptom of a look. Don't treat anyone as an object. Don't treat yourself as an object. Don't predicate yourself. It's a form of violence. Because when you down, download yourself in the narrative, whatever your lens is, and you're objectifying yourself as a predicated entity, you're cutting yourself off from your source, and you're doing violence to yourself. So it's a culture of violence. And non-violence is moving into the integral, holistic, awakening script, which is all the geniuses are calling them. So when you go into the Christ script, script, you have to transcript. So what is the prescription for the human condition? This script is, is dysfunctional in our evolutionary journey. Don't get stuck here. Open up. Rise. And the prescription is scription. We've got a script in the integral script. That's one of the main points I want to make. How, are we seeing that? In our, in our transpersonal work and in our activism. I've been working with the most elite activists on the planet. I, I formed a World Commission on Global Consciousness in 1998. Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, Jane Goodall, Robert Thurman, Cornel West, Wangari Maathai, who won the Nobel Prize uh, two, three years later for peace, was on my commission. I was co-founding it because I felt we had to get some of the leaders to help humanity get global consciousness, which is a global intelligence, to wake up. Because this is taking us down, that, that level of, of, of dominant literacy. As our great teachers saw, when, when Buddha brought his medicine, he saw humans were suffering. It was urgent. But have we gotten it? Have we gotten the Buddha medicine? Have we gotten the yoga medicine? Yoga is all over America now, for example. My father was a teacher of yoga in New York City in 1948. And my sons and daughters are teachers of yoga in America. But this is yoga. Yoga to the ego culture, ego-based yoga is not yoga. The first axiom of yoga is yoga is a quieting of predication. So that you can enter into the home space and breathe. So your breathing, so your asana is not ego-based, but ritually to allow the feel, the source, to breathe you. And that's prana, that's life. That's life source. So the ethics, if we're living a culture here, there's something immoral about it because we're objectifying everything we touch. So I would say to Anne this morning, we objectify nature. We objectify this mis misogyny, true. But there is autophobia, there's autoviolence to ourselves. It's not just the other we're violating, we're violating ourselves by processing ourselves here. 
and the moral teachers are saying, when you go into this space, what happens? You go into a language of I and thou. The other, there is an other, I and other, but it's not cut off and objectified. It's a presence. So transpersonal intelligence is dialogue. And dialogue is touching the infinite connectivity. And when you can stand to an other in your broken dialogue of your worlds, and the Christian and the scientist and the, and the Buddhist and the person in feminist thinking can get together in the dialogue space and hold your lens open and not impose your lens on the other. It takes courage to do that. And now you're going to the transpersonal language of deep dialogue across worlds. And that's where you get peace, and that's where you get awakened human beings, and that's, that's a transpersonal person. That's a person. That's a human. So a birthing process for the metamorphosis is just to sum this up. Oh, did I use a oh. How did that get it? So this is the final calligraphy. Okay, I want to just focus on that with you. Metamorphosis, the ultimate evolutionary metamorphosis is from I to I am. That metamorphosis is moving from this space into the space of connectivity, the source, the language of the source. Every word that we have here, X, is going to have an analog, double bracket X. Any word, a grain of sand, a chair, pen, a human, whatever it is, every word. So the law of language is X, every X is X. Not A is A. But every X is X. Which is what this is saying, every word. So I use the word just as you can get a DUI driving under the influence. We, we can get an LUI living under the influence of the double bracket field. It's, it's pulling on us all the time. And, and our natural is to allow it to, if you can step out of the way, we will allow the awakened person to come forth, right? So it's, it's, it's a, the, the teachers saw that you couldn't have an ego story without the zone, without the source of the source of language sourcing it. And ego mentalism is desourcing yourself and thinking you're self-sourcing. And that's a source of suffering. And healing for the great teachers is resourcing and realizing you are, or you are, the I is already held by the high self, by the transpersonal. So the person is more fundamental and primary than the ego construct. And we shouldn't reverse it and say, oh, that's a person, let's go transpersonal. Let's give away the deepest power of the intelligence. So I just don't know how we fix that, but we, so rather than call it transpersonal, we should call it transegoic. We're not ego sapiens, we're logo sapiens. And the morphology that we're talking about is moving from an ego pillar to a Buddha fly. I'm playing. Not the caterpillar story. Right? Just as a caterpillar has to let go, without dishonoring the caterpillar, the caterpillar is a prelude to maturing as a butterfly. And an ego pillar has to be respected and embraced and loved, call it shadow or whatever you like. And in that morphology, it matures into a Buddha fly into a human. And that is the pathway of our evolutionary awakening and the morphology. So to sum up, the technology of egomental, monocentric, i it culture is inherently a fragmentation consciousness. It's disintegral. It's not that it was integral and now it's disintegrating. It never was integrated. It was always chop-chop. And we are chop-chop. And so, it, the path of integration is, of wholeness is to go into the awakened source language, intelligence. So the point is that our consciousness follows our script. You can't be using this script and have this intelligence, this <coughs> consciousness. Your consciousness is scripted. So if you're living a sin script, and this is an important point, it's not sin. <coughs> sin is not just we bad, we did some, it's a look at technology, a broken language form and consciousness that we're using that chops our mental states into brokenness and our lives and ourselves. That's a problem. And to heal it, you need a whole integral, trans-egoic script, right, to become a person, a whole person. 
so that we've got to pay t attention to our mind operating process. And I'm asking our culture here, if we're transpersonal thinkers and revolutionaries and evolutionaries, are we trying to do it here? Or are we realizing that there is the source, as Anne was beautifully saying this morning, that we've got to, to awaken the divine family? The place of compassion and love and justice. All of those virtues of being a, a, a healthy culture. We need this intelligence and literacy to, to, to cultivate. So the ultimate activism is activism with the source. Source activism. And that's why I was bringing up the World Commission, because I tried to help our teachers, uh, our guides in the World Commission, as noble and well known as they are, to see what our great evolutionary pioneers are calling of global consciousness. They, they didn't seem to, they just went on with their work. I, I, I was part with uh, Irvin Laszlo, as a co chair of the World Wisdom Council. But Irvin Laszlo, you've heard of him. Uh, he, he's my buddy. And we're, we formed a World Wisdom Council to say, let's help move the planet to an evolution, to an awakened consciousness, to the Akashic field. That's, that went silent after about three, four years of effort. I'm with the evolutionary leaders now for the last co founder with Deepak Chopra and Marianne Williamson and Gene Houston and uh, Lipton and Greg Braden, then McTaggart, all of them are friends. I bring them to my college to uh, present the, the, this and I say, how, if we're going to be evolutionary leaders for the culture and the crisis, have we heard the voices of our evolutionary elders, like Jesus and Buddha and Moses and Krishna, that they were calling us to evolve? And that was a, they were evolutionary pioneers. Have we heard them? And it's like deaf ears. Let's go back to what we're doing, global warming is over here. And we're looking at symptoms in the box, and I'm looking at the cause, the medical cause, which is, look at the technology we're using. So I'll conclude by suggesting that what is the real activism we need? And that's what I've come to now after decades of working with these leaders and saying, let's go, let's do it. I'm uh, hearing in this culture here now so many agonizing voices of people who are being beat up in their institutions for, for daring to bring up transpersonal and, and say, what do we do? And my question for us, for conversation, is do we see the difference? The person, the awakened person, is in the awakened script and the literacy we're using matters. We are as we script. And if we want to be awakened and enlightened, we have to use an awakened script. We can't use a one that's functional and produces the crisis. So and for me, I reached a point in my career where I realized, and this is what I'm writing in my book called Global and Awakening, Global Enlightenment, The Maturation of Our Species, is the title of my book. I've seen that the only activism in town now, after 2,000 plus years of hearing these teachers, is to help humanity call out the single bracket technology that's got us and holding us captive. And the need to really see and get literacy in the integral double bracket script. And I call you, can, you can speak English. How many languages do you know? Or can you speak English? Zenglish, I playfully call it. Zen English, right? We need that to really tap and open up the consciousness. So this is ineffable. That's why the mystics say, oh, you can't talk about this. Truth you can't talk about, because to talk is, double, is dualistic, right? But I'm saying, is it so because Jesus spoke, Buddha spoke, Krishna spoke? And why? Because in the beginning is a word. What is that? Script, language. So is there a deeper script than we realize? Yeah, that's the point. So why aren't we getting it? It's my question. That's a transpersonal for me. And um, so we have to go from English to Zenglish. And dilated words. Thanks for your patience and your I don't know how long I talk, but I didn't intend to talk too long. But I want to have questions and conversation. Yes, do you need the microphone? Is there someone with the microphone here? Lots of hands. No. Could you speak out? Stand up and speak up. I can, I can, I can. Um, I wanted to just bring up uh, the language of music. Um, uh, it, is, it is my world, the world of music. And perhaps um, in some sense I can just relate very quickly my own experience, which um, began as a very small child with, with piano studies, um, and, uh, and then uh, later to different instruments. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I came across a, 
Zen master of the Shakuhachi, which I'd always, which had always had a calling to me. Uh, but uh, there wasn't, oh, there wasn't Thank anyone around uh, that was um, uh, a master of the of the instrument. Closer. So, um, and uh, one of my first lessons there was that um, not that I'm now too old to become um, a shakuhachi player or a musician, but if I just play one note for the rest of my life, each breath is the life in that instrument mm -hmm. and the connection between me and the instrument. And it has helped me ever since in all my music. Mm. Um, though I think I can also trace these, these elements. I'm bringing things a little bit into what, what I can understand is my reality. Um, that uh, the journey can begin when we're very young with what we see or what we hear. And, um, and it has been the word, the world of the word has sometimes been a bit over, overpowering for me. Uh, but the language of music is somewhere that I could reach into and still do in the journey. Thank you. Uh, I totally resonate with that. My son is a gifted musician. And he is struggling with the culture, not that he's a rock star, but he doesn't want to rock that way. He wants to bring music. And so we're going to play one of his great songs on Saturday at the, at the event, um, Children of the Sun. It's a, it goes beyond what Michael Jackson did in We Are the World. It's saying we are children to the family of humans. We're children of the, of the sun. Let's come together and step, step outside the box. Right? So music is powerful, a shift. And he's, He's realizing he's not an ordinary ego rock star, but he wants to bring the sound here, source sound, through his music. So that's powerful what you should. Thank you. There are others in the back. Yes. You said that we have a choice. Do we have to so know who has the choice? Who is the one who has the choice? Great. And that's, that question, as you see, there's an ambiguity between which language, and it came up earlier, in everything we do, the question in spiritual awakening, who? Is it the ego? Or the transpersonal self that's already here, that's, that's the one that's empowered with choice? So when Buddha says, this is suffering, we have a choice, and someone this morning said, allow, we have to allow. And Kant, the great philosopher, saw that in, in my earlier picture, that human free of choice is not something that is happening in the phenomenal self that you can describe and predicate. He saw that that is causally determined. Kant said there is no language for the thing on sich, the thing itself. You can't, you can't touch it, because language is here for Kant. But he saw in his ethics that the self, the autonomous self, is noumenal. It's not phenomenal. This is a self that appears, but the deeper the self as she is in herself, which cannot be predicated, is the autonomous self. That's a moral self of choice. So the good question you're asking, anything we do, who is doing it? If I'm performing the ritual, any sacrificial ritual of, say, the sacrament of the Last Supper, and I am going to take this wine and transmute it into wine. So if I drink the wine, who drinks? If I ego drink it, it's dead. But if I can drink the wine, it transmutes into the blood of Logos. And if I can eat this bread ritually, not I, the ego, eating ego bread, but bread, it is the body of Logos. So Jesus in his parting said, from now on, whatever you do, I mean, not the ego you, but the Christ within you, let her eat, let her walk, let her breathe. That's yoga. So who does the yoga? Is, is the ego does the yoga? Or does this ego get out of the way to let the yoga happen? Do I ego breathe? Or do I have breath to breathe me? Do I play the music? Or do I let the sound resonate through me? It, you switch over in the inversion. So that's a huge question. 
and eating disorders, the teachers knew that if you ego eat and you're trying to get organic foods and you go to Whole Foods and pay a lot of money, you get organic in America, it's big. I'm going to get organic. And I'm going to eat organic. But really, who's eating? And can you go organic? I'm serious. You follow? Yes. That's what Anne was saying. Yes. Let's eat organic. But you can't ego eat organic. No. You've got to let go of the ego eater. And all of the bulimia and anorexic, all of the dietary, obesity, stuffing ourselves. You follow? Krishna says that in the Gita very clearly. If you stuff your face, he doesn't say that. He says, if you eat your food and you prepare it for yourself, your ego self, you're going to eat sin. But if you eat the remains of your offering, then you will break the karma. So you give your food to, to God, he says, thank you. Thanksgiving. And then you eat it. Then you eat high food. Right? Yes. That's, that's holistic foods. It's a gentleman in the back. <laughs> the gentleman in the back, and then he'll come to you. Hello, Hello again. I'm glad to meet you again once more. It's always pleasant to meet you. And to begin with, I think that it might sound peculiar at the beginning, saying that maybe the, this state of separation, which is actually awful, might be a blessing because we feel we are separated, because something deep inside us can recall the memory of unity. So that's what we know, the new state of being. It's like when you are swimming in the sea or do scuba diving, you don't feel wet. But when you step outside on the beach, the remains of the water remind you. It's a deep new state of being and remind you and make you feel something peculiar. But you still remember of the water. So in this state we are now, and now is only something like virtual perception because in our real, in the core of our being, in our real state of being, there's not before and after. And I'm glad that you mentioned it before. Nirvana is here. The blessing is here. We are here, deep inside it. It's not inside us. We are inside it. Good. It's a state of being. Yeah. And we are still in this. We have never left something because there's nowhere here and there, before and after, time-space continuum is something we have created to describe something. It's the world of the analogies. The little I and the big I, the eternal thing that is ever happening. So what is necessary is what you mentioned by one of my dearest terms, Dig an I love it so much. I even named my gothic rock band once in the past. In German, after you know, that is a thing itself, the Dig an sich. Think on self like think by itself. It's the real thing to put it simply in English. So it's a transition of perception. It begins with the demand, not just mumbling about it or wishing it well. It's demanding by yourself to remember, become again, because you know somewhere deep inside you that you already are there. So you move from one point of view to the other which already belongs to you. And that demands to remind yourself that from atomon, you're prosopon, to Greek, the Greek terminology, you're a person. You're a singularity, but you're also something unique. And if you recognize this sense of unique to everybody else, that makes this meeting of persons precious. Yeah. In the Christian tradition, even the God is three faces, yeah. three persons, prosopa, that means face and person at the same time. And he's related, it's one nature, three persons, related to each other by pure love. Because if it was necessary due to the divine nature to be conducted, you induce necessity into God, and God is God never okay. anymore. Yeah. So, you. yeah. interpersonal communication, if it's based on mutual respect and love, can move us from a person to a interpersonal relations and back into the transpersonal perception which relates us all to ourselves and everything around us Good. which is deep inside. Thank you, well said. What you started up, thank you, I want to be mindful of our time, that separation can be a good thing, a challenge, if you can listen and remember so that it can also be painful. All of the agony of when Buddha say people suffer, when you're de-sourced and you think you're self-sourcing and you're an object of 
partition that you've made yourself here, and you've d d defamed and deformed yourself from here, it's lonely, you have nihilism, you have emptiness, you have postmodern dejection, cultural depression. All of this comes from being severed from the source. All of these multiple symptoms. That can be a, a challenge now to say, how do I heal this? So the crisis, the crisis that we face now on the planet, right, and we're all facing that, can, can transpersonal discourse and intention be a moving force for the planet? Yes, right? Because the call to becoming whole, right? If we see that all of the crises and the breakdowns and the disintegration can be moved to integration, just look at that theme. This is where you get the integration. This is inherently disintegrative. This is integrative and holistic and whole. The whole person, the whole culture, the whole environment. As I was saying, the source, when you get to the source, the feminine, divine, it gets linked by love and compassion and, and justice. And this is where we heal the culture, by moving into that space of deep dialogue, not monologue. Not I it, but I thou. So thank you for that. This gentleman. Thank you. Uh, I don't agree with, I don't disagree with anything you said. But uh, are you familiar with Asparsha Yoga? Asparsha Yoga. No, not that particular name of yoga. There's are so you many different. Are familiar with Gaudapada? Yes, of course. Well, it's a, he was exponent of Asparsha Yoga. Yeah. And uh, in Gaudapada's Karikas, he writes, uh, there is no dissolution, no birth, none in bondage, none aspiring for wisdom, no seeker of liberation, and none liberated. This is the absolute truth. He also said, um, there is no jiva born because there is no cause that can produce it. Uh, the supreme truth is that no, nothing is ever born. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, I do, thank you. That's a great, uh, I've studied Gaudapada, and Gaudapada was very influential for Shankaracharya, Shankara in an Advaita Vedanta. And Gaudapada was influenced by Nagarjuna, one of my heroes, who is a Buddhist founder of the Madhyamika tradition. Uh, Madhyamika is the middle way. It's not the middle way between extremes here, but the middle way to Buddha truth. So what you said in the Gaudapada voice is that when you are in this space, right? When you are in the zone, and that's, and that's where we are. Oh, it's, but the supreme truth then is Brahman is all. Yes, but is I, I like the picture of the calligraphy of that. So when you're in and speaking from the non-dual Advaita, the non-dual or the Buddha Shunyata of emptiness, when you have when we have arrived at that space, we don't have any more brackets. No single brackets, no double brackets. And the thing about the single bracket is just a teaching device to help us see and realize that we need. So what you're saying, if we can imagine how you would speak from the deep space of emptiness, or even be silent, Buddha's silence, that says it all. There's nothing to say. There's nothing arising. All of the story that we've created, once you burn off and deconstruct the artificial stage of artificial language that created all the mess, then we can dance. And there's no beginning, no end. Now you're in the zone language, you're in transpersonal discourse. So that would be my response. Thank you very much. Okay. I want to ask something about what you were just talking about. Is it on? Is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, about what you said, when we reach that point, we have no brackets. We don't, we don't need them. Anymore. Yes. That's yes. what our teachers are saying. Yes. And how are we going to be in this world when we are in that state of mind? Which world? <laughs> physical world. Which physical? 
I'm serious. I mean, you, you just are yeah. you're saying that when, when, to when this as long world? as we're in this world, in this world, the word this is ambiguous. Just like the word here, here. I want to be here, here or here. So the premise of this remark is imagine a state of our evolution where we've gone transpersonal and we've outgrown the caterpillar mm -hmm. into the butterfly yes. and our culture is flowing in harmony the way Anne was describing now we're sourcing of the divine feminine is alive again right? that's the this world not that world this world so like the pen here is alien it's, it's thrown on the ground it's an object but here the pen is a sacred presence so it's I and the pen right? So when, when we enter that culture, the Middle Eastern crisis that seems intractable, that we can't be here together in this soil as brother and sister loving each other, right? Which, 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 which we can't seem to do here. We can't bring our worlds and polarities together and resolve them. So what you're asking, I'm, I'm coming back to you, you're more talented in that world when we entered this language, but that world has been deconstructed, that code has been burnt off, you know, that essentially. That's, that's what those teachers would say, speaking from the zone. So there's no physical body that's No, physical. no, which body? Every word has a, yeah? So the ego body is objectified, it's callous, it's unfeeling, it's not alive. Yoga is waking up the body. Nature is objectified, as Anne would say, and disrespected, but nature is alive. The physical world is beautiful. The body is a temple. So there's still the physical world. Of course. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. But this is important, though, you see? Because it's not that the body is, is bad, right? It's that, check out your body. That's why we do with pen. It's a physical pen. Oh, wow, I was, uh, I was downsizing the pen. See? So imagine a culture in which we've got the literacy, we are as we script, and we're using an integral, transpersonal, holistic script, and everything is sacred and shining and flow. And our culture is a culture in the zone. And we're compassionate, and we're in love, and we're in justice. Not in justice, but in justice. Right? That our bodies are alive. And so the person who said, how long will we live in our bodies if we can open up our dormant bodies? That's one of my experiments. I mean, you don't know my age, but I've been teaching 47 years, and my eldest daughter is 53, and I feel more alive now than ever. And it's not that I can't die, I can be taken out in a flash with disease or accidents. I've had near-death moments. But I wonder, if you live in the zone, if you're cut off, if you live an ego-based life, you're going to have an ego-aging problem. Right? You're going to prematurely age. But if you can live in the zone, what is your your cellular body going to be like, your brain, your, your energy and vitality. If this, That's oh, what I was asking. I mean, I didn't phrase it correctly. Okay, this is... What happens to our physical presence? Yeah, what, what happens? So I'm asking a question as a researcher. Part of my research as a philosopher is, do we have to ego age the way we do when we're cut off from the zone? When the teacher's saying, this is like Buddha is saying, mindfulness is immortality. This thoughtlessness is death. Socrates, the body may be poisoned, but you can't touch me. And he drinks the hemlock. Right? Because I am... Right? So spirit can't die. Spirit can't... But so spirit body, if we can awaken our body, have we touched our bodies yet? You follow? So the physical world is, is desecrated. But what would we like to encounter nature in all her glory? Which is what Anne was inviting us in the next revolution of divine feminine. You follow? That's nature. Thank you for the question. Can I ask one more thing? Maybe we should give the gentleman behind you a chance, because time is okay. over. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. My name is Gatis. I'm from Latvia. From? Um, Latvia. Oh, Latvia. Yeah. You Hi. have been there. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah, been. yeah, I was not. And um, according to what you have said now, I think that you can take your black marker and uh, this word disintegration 
just uh, clear them. No, 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 no. Uh, just <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I would because, because Lindy will be maybe surprised when they come next time step in. And, but because this integration has happened, so it, as you said, it's never has been integrated. So the disintegration, we don't need to put extra effort on it, so we clear it. So the next integration, if we are living in conscious living, then integration, it's... Uh, it's already. It's complete. already. I think so, they're complete. Yeah, so take your marker and the next word also you can. <laughs> and uh, conscious so living... He's a bad boy. <laughs> conscious living, I think you can put in your double brackets and uh, we will follow that nobody clears the, the, the second one, what, what, what's omitted in, in your in your announcement. Yeah, you yes, saw yeah. Okay, that was a uh, jogging part. But the second part, I will try to be more serious. Uh, uh, according to the living in uh, single brackets and double brackets, I will try to use your, your, your language, uh, how I understand the thing is that uh, if there was a big plan, let's assume that there was a big plan how our universe was created, the, uh, the step was made between nothing and something, so the big born, which is still mystery, and the big wonder, of course, uh, according to my understanding the big plan was either to change something or to develop something or to just to see so according to the one theory uh, the big nothing split himself into something and nothing and from one point wanted to absorb another point so uh, that being the selves different selves it's uh, just a tool for big, big god, Adam, Adam Kadmon, for whatever, to observe himself. Of course, at the end of the day, at the end of the Brahma's sleeping day, we will come back, we will be all integrated. But at the moment, we are separated for some reason. I don't know this reason exactly, but yeah, we can guess what the reason was. Of course, uh, when the baby is born, he needs this self to somehow distinguish to, to somehow to act, but we are uh, we have a gift of uh, a mind and ability to be cons consciousness. So our task is from the baby uh, uh, baby stated mind uh, from feeling separated to become uh, the part of something, but still remind some personalities. So we are droplets in the big sea, but still we can understand that we are droplets. I think that story about being of, uh, of a single bracket person is just for us to keep this personal. Otherwise, if it's a big water and it's still a big water, nothing changes. But the only change is possible that uh, have them to, to, to spread in the droplets, which at the end of the day come together as a big sea, but with a changed, with changed state of the mind. We are something, we are still the part of the big universe, but we are something. Thank you. Let me, uh, I know time is up, and I'd just like to comment in, in closing with an excellent remark, and to translate it, it's that separation is a prelude, uh, you know, in other words, why did this happen? Why was there a fall or a rise, however you, why are we in the present situation? Well, looking at the good news is, separation is a condition that allows us to integrate and come together Right? So, in, in other words, if Brahman is infinitely unbeginning and without end, and God, Yahweh, why was there creation and diversity, and then humanity, and Adam and Eve, and culture and separation, and all of this egomentalism? Well, you, you say, because the infinite wanted to playfully know herself, and to diversify, and even though diversity and scatteredness and the Tower of Babel may be a terrible, it's a prelude to now coming back and breathing and integrating and transpersonal. And you said something that I would question is because the teachers knew that the infinite is infinite process. It's always infinite flow. The infinite is infinitely flow. So it is It's orchestra. all maya. It's all maya. It's all infinite flow. All right? so, but it's not that this is still a big puddle. It's not that when you go into the ocean, the divine feminine is a meltdown of diversity. It's a melt up to true individuality because when you're awakened in the transpersonal, you're everyone is unique. Indra's net has infinite diversity in unity.
that's e pluribus unum, that's on the American penny. E pluribus unum, out of the many one. You can't say that in the ego America, right? With a broken civic space and ego mental culture and democracy. Democracy is we the people. And to get together is we the people with diversity and honoring individuality is sacred. And yet connected is we for the power of the people. We need the technology of transpersonal intelligence and deep dialogue. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so let's continue. This is, help me, please. I mean, you, I'm doing my book, Global Enlightenment, and I'd love to hear your advice about whether this makes sense. Uh, you as transpersonal culture people, how do you relate and how do you answer that question? If we're trying to inscribe transpersonal here, I find that problematic. Because for me, transpersonal needs to bring it out to the open that, oh, it's a deeper shift. Let's do the transpersonal. That's what feels to me. I would love your advice and help. Yes, yes thank you. Um, I, I have been exploring the difference in my own life between the fragment consciousness and the fractal consciousness, which yeah, you said. Good. Um, I, and I've been trying to cultivate uh, I've been trying to cultivate my own script or my own how I identify myself when I'm in the fractal state. So I wondered if you or anyone else here um, had some ideas about how to cultivate the way we think, the way we feel about ourselves, the way we speak to people in that um state, in that fractal state. Great question. Anyone like to comment on that? Did you hear the question? How does it feel to be a trans person? A person, a mensch. Someone awakened and mindful, mindful living. What does that feel like? Well, psychologically, how does it feel? How do you relate? What do you do? Right? I'll try first to answer. My life has been in practice of that. Because when I began to see our great teachers, and you and I it life or an I thought to raise my children, for example. If my children are sacred beings, and I want to raise them, I've got five children, who they got me. I don't got them. Right? But as a father, I want to help them educate them in the literacy. Someone says a child has to, you know, when I'm teaching the child a pen, I can say, oh, honey, this is a pen. You're not the pen. This is the pen. This is the another pen. And you can give that language. But I, the child already has in her heart the integral calculus. And to help the child understand, because the child already holds a mom, right, and understands relation. And, and interact, right? And the child is not isolated, as someone suggested. The child has to be taught isolation and schooled in the separation of a, of a cruel script, right? That the teacher says, don't do that to your kids. So you're abusing your child if you inscribe them. So I had to consciously try to raise my children to be human and teach them dialogue in multiple, infinite ways. My son is running out of the room, and Grandpa is sitting there reading the paper. He lets the door slam and says, Sweetie, did you see Grandpa? Did you see the door slam? Could you walk like a yogi? You know, and he laughs, and he, he gets dialogue. Right? That's why I formed the Global Dialogue Institute. Dialogue is an art and a skill of being human. It's a literacy of I thou. You speak to me. Do I listen to you with my lens, or do I open up and allow you to speak? Right? So I'm teaching dialogue, the art of dialogue, this transpersonal law. And dialogue means dialogos, open up to the logos. It means you've got to not privilege your lens on the other person. I can't lens you to them. Follow? So deep dialogue literacy is what I'm teaching my students at Haverford and Bryn Mawr College for 40 plus years. What does it mean to be an educated liberal arts student who can see the connections between music and mathematics and number and ratio and measure and reason and rhyme? and make the links, because when you have the source code, that's the whole, this talk has been the quest for the missing code of Logos. And I'm using the double brackets to help bring up the code. And the code is not a code that I can say, oh, here's the code, let me give it to you. The code is surfing the zone. You see what I mean? You have to be the code. And your mom can't give it to you. You have to say, I am. Each person has to say, I am. Every person has to find her own password an access code into the code. And that's really what I'm saying. That is where you become a human. See so imagine a culture that lives in dialogue. We don't have it in the Middle East. We don't have it in the civic space in America. Do we have deep dialogue between the people? 
We don't. We have factions and power plays and, you know, fighting with money to fund your voting, get the most votes in. See what I mean? It's far from we the people. So I, I would take your question and invite others to comment that the art of dialogue, to raise a child as a dialogue I thou being, we're human, the person, the trans person that is dialogue being I thou, and that's ethics. So raise your child as a moral being to be sensitive in the situation they're aware, and that's mindful living. So conscious living of our great teachers, when I walk in the Christ, Quakers, right? It's that of God in every man. You have an honor code. How do you relate to the other and nature, which is sacred? How do you walk in sacred space? How do we educate our children? So, so that's how I sought to raise my children. Well, and, and they are quite amazing beings. People look at them and say, where do they come from? They're aliens. And they had a lot of struggle. My three younger ones, I was married twice. And the first one broke up because we couldn't meet here. I proposed the second time. It was my childhood sweetheart. Our great lovers were in love. And I married her when I was 19. First daughter was born when I was 20 as an undergraduate. She's 53. That may be giving away my age. But, you know, and, and they grew me up, and I grew up and stumbled around the <coughs> city with my two children, my two daughters. And then I got married again in a second time. And by now I was ready to, I was discovering what it means to be a human and to raise my children from day one in a sacred, sensitive space. And now people see them and say, Where did they come from? You know, one is a great rock star, a source musician, the other one is a captain of the US Air, a pilot and a yoga teacher teaching presence yoga. My daughter is working in a crisis clinic in Seattle helping people on the hotline who call in on suicidal you know, breakdowns. She's helping them. And, 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 and my kids struggle between the two cultures. They're bicultural, but it created a problem for them because if you raise your child here and they have to go into the world, Student says, Professor, when I leave the college and I go into the real world, what's going to happen to me? And I said, what is the real world? What did you learn? And reality, ontology, this is the real world. This is the artificial, tentative, dysfunctional space. See what I mean? Does that help? Okay. In the back. That was your, your great audience. This is a great question. Oops. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to carry on this very interesting dialogue of, of this sort of schizophrenic type life of having the knowledge of the transpersonal and, but being sort of caught with unconscious people in our lives. I mean, I'm on the front lines. I'm an elected politician. And I'm trying to take that world that I know and love on and dealing constantly with people who we're not talking the same language. That's right. And what, what keeps me going is that I have that connection to source. And people say to me all the time, how can you stand it? And I can stand it because I have that connection. Yeah. But I was very, very happy to hear you talk about your global council on leadership. And, but I found it a little bit discouraging when you said, well, where did it go after a couple of years with all these great minds and thinkers yeah. and world leaders? So I, I would like to hear from you, what, what can you offer to us now to take this wonderful knowledge? And, and how do we put it into practice in this world that's here, even though we're there? Great, great question. And that was some of the end of this morning session said, what do we do? And, uh, and Tana is holding the World Council of Elders tonight at 9.15 to answer, what do we see? What do we do in this crisis world that our survival is threatened? And it's, it's, it's the, 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 the medical condition seen by our great teachers for centuries, millennia, we're still, I, I imagine in my movie, imagine if Moses and Jesus and Buddha and Mohammed and Krishna and Lao Tzu, to mention a few, and all the beautiful Sophias who embody the wisdom on the planet were to gather in Crete to look at the state of the planet from the eyes of the transpersonal wisdom and to measure how well has humanity done in listening to the medicine and getting it. What would that kind of convocation on Crete be like? I imagine that in my movie. That's going to be some moment in the Avatar 2 movie. You know, when you have these imagined Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Lao Tzu coming together 
right? Mohammed to meet on the island, to just look at the planet and says, where are we folks? How are we doing? They would say, oy vey. <laughs> because we didn't, we don't, we, we, we're stalled at the wall. There's some big barrier that's holding us from upscripting. So what do I say to the evolutionary leaders? I say to them, and they're sitting in the room, and I'm saying to them in our retreat, Again, these are the evolutionary leaders, are the frontier people that we... And I said, have, when we try to do activism, if we're doing activism, forget all of this and just do activism up in the world that we live in, in its terms, using ego-based language to deal with the ego symptoms that are symptoms of, 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 of the technology, right? But if we're trying to stop global warming, or stop nuclear weapons, or deal with water crisis, or deal with economics and justice, and all of these are symptoms of some deep medical condition that's generating a fragmentation technology. And so we've got to call it out, because doing because that's an evolutionary Titanic, and you can go and do your activism on the Titanic, but it's not going to deal. And so I've had meetings, town meetings at Harvard College, for burnt out activists who gather and say, Professor Gangadi. You are organizing this meeting, a town meeting, on activism. We're burnt out. It was in the Bush administration. He says, we're not getting anywhere with the Bush administration. We don't know what to do anymore. We're burnt out. We're done. Right? And someone said in the audience, you know, if when Gandhi called the salt march in India, that somehow got, went viral and called the people out of the villages to walk to the ocean in protest for the salt march. We need Gandhi. If only Gandhi were here. And I'm standing in front of the room like this. I'm thinking, what do I say now? <laughs> and I just, I just was moved. And I, says, I looked up and I said, Gandhi is here. And everyone said, what? What do you mean? He said, he would call an ego strike. <laughs> and there was trouble. And then I said, well, let's move on. He says, no. What you just said is it. The salt march of our time now is to help the people see. If you're egoing, using an ego mental language form and structure, then you have to take responsibility for making the world the way it is, because we are as we mind. And if we're using an ego calculus for our culture, we're having an ego-based fragmented world. Don't blame Bush. Don't blame uh, someone else. Take responsibility. Look at the man in the mirror as Michael Jordan. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. Right? I'm asking him to change his ways. Well, what does that mean? Call an ego strike for the nation. And I call that for the evolutionary leaders. And they're going to do it in Washington to rent six hotels and have a march in Washington to call a national ego strike for the nation as a teaching device for transpersonal awakening. Because people are going to say, what the hell is an ego strike? I never heard of that. So that's the point. That's the point. It occasions now to say, Oh, there's ego minding. Oh, ego mentalism. What's that? Oh, I'm egoing. Oh, I'm abusing my children. I'm packaging everything. I'm abusing to raise consciousness. To me, that's the cutting edge of activism. If we don't do that somehow, then we're going to just keep on doing activism on the Titanic and feeling burnt out more and more, and the symptoms are going to grow worse medically. So to me, the, my being here, and sharing this is to call to my friends in the transpersonal movement. Folks, if we're trying to talk transpersonal talk here, integration, disintegration, conscious living, and we, we somehow can't bring this out in your own way, don't use single brackets or double brackets. Use bananas and apples right, to mark the difference between the two. They're between flavor. Right? So I say to my students, you find your own way to, to disentangle the two languages, right? and then you'll see, oh my god, the activism is, this is taking us down. And people don't get it for 2,000 plus years. We're not getting the medicine. So call it out. So that's my advice. The, 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 the lab work of culture for these two, 3,000 years shows that we're stalled in some profound way. The gathering of our great elders who say, oh my god, we're not getting the medicine of awakening and up, we're downloading, we're not upscripting. We've got to get this into the open to medically get to the problem, right? To heal the planet, to, to, to get into the zone together. Does that help? That's what I would say. Uh, yeah, it does, but at the same time I'm thinking, how am I gonna take that to a corrupt council that doesn't even, I mean, it's apples and oranges again. 
That's right. You know, but That's I, right. I understand that. I work yeah. with myself at the transpersonal level, but it's it's getting from there to you know the bridge. Okay, as a politician, yeah. for speaking and representing the people, could you take it to the people? Oh, I do. Okay. And that makes me really popular. Let me tell you, <laughs> with with some voters, yes, because they want change. Okay. You're talking very easy issues, transparency, community good, you know, protect the environment, easy stuff. Well, here, here's what I'm thinking. I face the same political impasse as a professor, 46 years in a violent culture. I call it academic violence. Trying to bring this literacy into, the, into philosophy. Imagine, I'm a philosopher. And you think that a philosophy department would love wisdom of Sophia. Right? Yes. But they're allergic, as we heard in the other speakers, there is a backlash of violence to, 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 if it's threatened. So I had to walk through fires for the last 40 years to dare to bring up this critique of the academy and where we are. So what if the students begin to occupy Founders Hall? You know, not just occupy Wall Street, but the call to people to occupy yourself, out yourself. See what I mean? That's out ourselves. That's a transpersonal call. And, and, and if the politicians and the structure and the regime and the holders of power won't do it, well then do bypass surgery. Is my, right? So in politics too, you face that, that rigid backlash, you see? It's in the academic is the worst, you can imagine, in academic life. So how do you deal with that? I hear many of our voices amongst us saying, we're hurting when we try to do that, you see? So, we, think we all face this together. You're going to take a lot of courage. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Connect with the divine. <coughs> That's right. And I hope you see what I'm saying. Uh, my my inflection on Anne is that she's saying the double brackets source is a divine feminine, as if the masculine has no role. And that the male has to be an ego, is identified with a single bracket patriarchal okay. SOB. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm, I'm questioning that gently to suggest the, the, the divine male and the divine, the Shiva and the Shakti together, right? And the rise of the goddess and the rise of the male when they come together in dialogue is a powerful moment for the Shiva and the Shakti to step up to it. You've got an upscript, see what I mean? And, 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 and so the diagnosis is that ego mentalism is an equal opportunity catastrophe for men and women. Women can engage in that too. And it was not necessarily imposed by a patriarchal. It could be a matriarchal regime. It could be ego feminism rather than eco feminism. So I just want to leave that there. Yeah, the divine feminine. I totally agree. The, the great, the mark of our great shift in you is a rise of the divine feminine. I embrace Anne. She's beautiful and wonderful, right? And I want to add to it. But just let's not think that it was the males who did this. It's an evolutionary stage of equal opportunity across the board for all genders. You see what I mean? And we all have to take responsibility and, and upscript together. That we might take on. We have five minutes left. I was just giving a warning. Where were you before? <laughs> I, I lost it. I've got 425 on my okay. watch. I was just going to comment to yeah. you about uh, there's a certain period of loneliness when you go into that transpersonal it's a wonderful freeing feeling, and you're, you're so glad you, you make it, but you're very much alone on that path. Well, uh, I mean, that's my experience. No, you're quite, that's universal. But when you say the word alone uh, and lonely, I want to clarify what, for me, I've been very lonely and alone at Haverford College for years. I was not with transversal, I was alone. I was seeing this teaching, and Sophia was guiding me, and I'm here, and I'm listening to great teachers, and I was literally alone. And I, I, and I was being sought to be silenced and stopped, and I wouldn't stop. I, I, I confronted the institution. The president had to resign. I, I, I was blacklisted. And for 30, 40 years, I had to stand through that. You know, even though I was a full professor and, and promoted with tenure, you know, tenure is prison. Yes. Right? Academic freedom is here. Academic freedom is getting free of the academy. It is not that in, when you have tenure in the academy, you're free and have free speech. No. You have to earn it. Yes. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's lonely. Yes. But then you realize that when you're in this 
source space, the I, which is I thou, then the other, all of the environment, all of the, in this space, you are never alone. True. You I follow? Feel, yes, absolutely. It took me a long time to get this. I, I, I feel that now. But there were many lonely years. Yeah, I'm, I'm embracing but that. But I never stopped. Yes. I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't. I know. And when Descartes said I am, mm -hmm. and stepped out of the box yes. in his lone meditation chamber, yeah. he felt desperately alone. Yes. I am. Who am I? I know not. But all I know is as long as I say it and think it to myself, I am. And then he worries, what if I stop thinking? I'll cease to be. It was death. And that provoked the dialogue that didn't discard. The infinite other was holding him all along. The source. He discovered the source holding him. And he was not alone. So he discovered the I thou. So the thou was already in him. And he was not alone. So the transpersonal awakened self is not lonely. She's not isolated, but connected. Right? You're in community. Yes? Actually, I have also a question. Um, I, I think maybe it connects a bit to that, but um, I find in every church, or maybe a spiritual or religious tradition, something for me. And right now I have a problem because back home I go to Krishna temple and then I go to also to Protestant church. And I find it, you know, I, I think both traditions and so on like something and but also have something that the other one doesn't. So the thing is, I see everything as one, but the problem is how to integrate everything because in each church people say, uh, this is the God, Jesus Christ is the God, and then they say Krishna is the God. And then, um, and I think it's also maybe because of this aloneness, because it's my way of, you know, doing something together with people who, my way of raising consciousness. But it just becomes a bit difficult to, you know, integrate because everybody says this is the right path and then the other. So I just wonder, you know, but there is no such, let's say, religion or group, in my area at least, that would practice transpersonal psychology, you know, just, um, I don't know, something, because I think it's just, um, groups are powerful, and for me it's easier to practice something, it gives you motivation and it brings you back to, you know, to the source, basically, so. That's a great question, let me comment, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. This is huge, because integration is the third point. The, 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 the second, and I, I was suggesting that as long as we are and not even recognizing this, this is, this is uh, uh, this, we're just here, and that's where we're living our cultural life, and we're trying to have all of these diverse worlds, and here as you go to the Christian church, and there's a Hare Krishna, yeah. and then I'm doing yoga, and I'm also practicing Feng Shui, and I'm even doing Kabbalah, okay. like, you know, and, oh my God, OMG, and they're all kind of competing for this space. Yes. Because unity here is sing single bracket unity re re replaces diversity. So which one is true? They're going to divide. Is it Allah or Yahweh? Yeah, and they're all you know. They're all true. They're all true. Well, yeah, yeah but, but, but check this out. They are all sourced. When you realize, oh, MG, Allah is here, and Krishna is here, and and Christ is here, and they're different. There's no other Christ who sacrificed on the cross. Krishna is not Buddha. Buddha is not Moses. Moses at the burning bush. They're all unique in this infinite sacred space. So integration here is not the same as in the disintegral space to integrate here. That becomes eclectic. I say, oh, I like to use the sacrament of the Catholic, and I, I enjoy doing this, you know, and I like some transpersonal experience, and I, you know, emotional intelligence, and, and I pick and choose, and Place them together in an artificial construct that I say is integrated. And it's not, because integral, in, in, the, in the deep dialogue space, you know? So, for example, a dialogue between Buddha and Krishna, uh, and, and Christ, a, a Christian and a Buddhist, what would that be like? Well, they're not talking here. Dialogue is not in a monologue. It's, it's listening to the Buddha and how many have discovered the double bracket card of Jesus? Question. This is huge. Because if you say Jesus is my Lord, and God is the only true God, Yahweh, or whatever, here, right? And, and Allah is...